All right, what a beautiful day it is to be in the house of the Lord, eh? All right, if you will, stand with us as we worship our awesome and mighty God.
morning, church family. It's great to see you today. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm glad to be here myself. I want to ask if you would take your bulletin. You see the welcome card attached. Please take a moment and fill that out. You can go ahead and pull that off. I want you to fill it out, put it in the offering plate. Bailey McClure, good to see you this morning. I have missed you. Good to see Bailey. Good to see so many, uh, not so many, all of the rest of you. That doesn't sound right. Some of you, it's good to see. Everybody, it's good to see. That's weird. I blame that on the pain medicine, okay? <laughs> Fill out the welcome card if you would. Put it in the offering plate. You can leave it here on the table if you don't have enough time. And if you're a guest, man, we're particularly honored to have you with us today. And we rejoice in you choosing to come and be uh, with us. I've had some surgery this week, and I invited my friend Clifton Brown to preach. He'll be here with us this morning and tonight, and I know um, you're anticipating the word of the Lord from Brother Clifton, so we're excited about him being here. I do want to just mention the one thing that uh, in the bulletin stands out to me. We're entering the season for uh, Annie Armstrong offering two major events in the life of Southern Baptists, and one of the key reasons why we are Southern Baptists, we have more missionaries in the field than anybody anywhere. We have North American missionaries, that's what the Annie Armstrong offering goes for, and there's about four or 5,000 of them, and I encourage you to uh, be in prayer. What is my part for the Annie Armstrong offering for North American missions? So be praying about that. That's uh, what we do at the Easter season. And in your bulletin, there is a, a guide for the week of prayer for North American missions. You can see other resources on their website as well. So you be sure and um, find your involvement and participate in that offering. Let's pray together. Father, together we lift up the name of Jesus. You're the only thing that matters. This world throws so many things at us. They're all distractions and confusion. You're the only thing that matters. And our lives belong to you. We need you and we call out to you for this time, for this day, that you would be on the throne in our hearts, that you would be maximally glorified in this room. We lift you up. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, we thank you for Fort Creek Baptist Church. What a family this is. Build us stronger. Help us to care for one another and to reach out to the people around us in this world. Every person we meet, you are the one who puts us in contact with those people. So give us the assignment to minister and care for people and share the gospel. And we pray that as we gather on Sunday, it would just be the celebration time for every way you've used us and for what you're doing in the life of our church. Build us, strengthen us, and grow us for your glory, God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One thing I've learned when, in my walk with Christ is sometimes when uh, you're hurting and you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say, sometimes you just have to shout to the Lord. And I know that he can, he can, he can take it. Thank you. 
that he lives in your heart, that you're living for him. If there's any doubt, any doubt at all, I urge you to listen to that still small voice in your head that I know you're hearing. Put out all the noise of the world, put all, all, all the noise of all the, the hard things in life and listen to God because he's calling you. He's calling all of us. All you have to do is answer that call. Most gracious heavenly Father, dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to come into your house, dear Lord, and worship you. Lord, I praise your name for sending your son, Jesus, who died for our sins, dear Lord. I praise the fact that you saved me. I praise the fact that you loved me enough to do that, dear Lord. And Lord, let us never forget the personal salvation, dear Lord. Just, just let us never forget that joy and that peace that we have. Dear Lord, I pray for the ones that are sick and that aren't able to be here today, dear Lord. Please be with them. Please, you know, heal them and be with their families. Be with the ones that are going through surgeries, dear Lord. Just comfort them. Be also with the ones traveling, dear Lord. Please give them travel and mercies and bring them home safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Redeemer 
If you will, we'd love for you to join us down here at the, at the altar with prayer time this morning, if you will. That's a gaggle of kids. All right, let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, I am so humbled to have this time to come to you. I thank you for everything that you have done in my life, dear Lord, my family, dear Lord. But dear Lord, this time here, we, we are praying for the for the service, dear Lord. We, uh, we pray that if there's anyone out here this morning that is, uh, don't, does not know you as our Lord and Savior, dear Lord, that uh, this morning it'll it'll all come to fruition, dear Lord. Just uh, just be with be with the speaker this morning. Just hiding behind the pulpit this morning, behind the cross, dear Lord. Just uh, have him say what you want him to say, how you want him to say it, dear Lord. Let us have open minds, open hearts, be receptive to his word, dear Lord, that he speaks this morning, that we know that comes from you. Dear Lord, just thank you for our pastor, dear Lord. Just pray for his shoulder, dear Lord, that things will will progress so quickly, dear Lord, in his recovery. We thank you for um, getting him through the surgery, dear Lord, and having him here this morning, dear Lord. I think think so. that's an awesome, awesome, uh, just an awesome thing this morning from from you, dear Lord. We know that only you could do that for him this morning to get him here to church, dear Lord. Just thank you for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. Well, good morning. good morning. What a joy it is to be back at Fort Creek Baptist Church this morning. I appreciate the invitation from your pastor to come and help him out during this time of his recovery. You've got to understand what it's like for me, a uh, guy like me, to step in 
especially when the pastor's sitting on the front row. Uh, there was a guy I read about uh, a number of years ago now that uh, survived the Johnstown flood. Years ago, there was a massive flood, and I believe it was Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and he survived it, and uh, he gave the Lord the credit and became somewhat famous. Uh, people asked him to come and give their testimony. So he'd go around and share his testimony about how he survived the Johnstown flood and uh, tell his story. Well, he finally made it to heaven, and when he did, he had the opportunity to share his testimony in heaven. And he got up, and he looked out, and guess who sat on the front row? Noah. There was Noah sitting right there on the front row. So uh, that's sort of the way I feel is uh, the pastor sitting here, and uh, he's like a Noah. But, uh, Tracy, I do appreciate uh, the invitation, and glad you're able to be here, and we pray for your healing. This is not the church I know, but I, I heard about a church that uh, had a pastor going through a rough patch with his health. And uh, his, his chairman of deacons visited him and said, Pastor, uh, you'll be glad to know that the deacons voted five to four that we'd pray for you. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure that's not Fort Creek, amen. But uh, do pray for him. Pastors need all, all the prayers they can get. Pastors face battles that others do not face. One of the reasons is we get put out there so much in the in the line of fire from the enemy, and uh, you, uh, I know, support him in that way and in every other way. But it is good to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity. I want you to turn your Bible this morning to the book of Genesis and chapter number 24. Chapter number 24. Uh, we're almost to the end of February. I don't know how we got this, uh, got here this fast. Man, this year is zipping on by. But uh, we're at the end. Uh, February is uh, a month that we associate with love. We have Valentine's Day right in the middle of it, except this year they got an extra day tucked in. But uh, February the 14th, and I'm sure you all observe Valentine's, and most churches have some kind of fellowship that go along with that. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, is a time to celebrate. The uh, probate judge's office in uh, our county, and I think a lot of other counties, just uh, announced that they would be having it run a special on marriage. I guess that's the way they would do it. They was not charged anything. You know, the probate judge can, uh, can officiate, and they were not charging anybody to marry. Anybody wanted to come to the courthouse and get married, they could do that. So uh, they, they were doing, I, I never saw how many couples might have taken advantage of that, but uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people do, it's associated with that. Well, uh, I said all of that to say that I was thinking and praying about the service, and I thought about one of my favorite uh, stories in the Old Testament that is so full of biblical truth that... Uh, I thought maybe this is something that the Lord would uh, use, and I pray that he will. And uh, I, I want to I talk to you today about a bride for Isaac, a bride for Isaac. You know, the Bible is uh, one of the, it is the most intriguing books, as well as being truthful and uh, the unfolding mind of God from Genesis to Revelation all the way through. Uh, you talk about uh, love stories, you can find it in uh, the Word of God that is more real than a lot of stuff they write about and put on TV. Uh, this is just such a chapter. It's a marvelous story of, uh, of how that uh, a man and a woman came to be wed. And, of course, there's other stories that you read about and uh, can talk about. Uh, one of the most interesting is, by the way, in the book of Hosea. I don't know if you've thought about that or not, but uh, in the book of Hosea, there's the story about the preacher that was in love with a prostitute, and that's what it was, and uh, you can read about that. It's also a marvelous story of redemption, marvelous story of redemption and how God worked in the life of Hosea. Well, there's a lot of rabbits we could chase, but I will not do that, but... Uh, 
I want you to look in the book of Genesis chapter number 24. This is the longest chapter in Genesis. There's 63 verses, uh, 67 verses in Genesis 24. The Lord only used 31 verses in chapter 1 to give us the whole story of creation. But when it come to the subject of bride and groom and marriage, he felt like it needed a little more attention. And given the state of, uh, of wedded uh, uh, bliss, of marriages, and the statistics we read about, it probably still deserves a whole lot more attention than what we're giving to it. Amen? And so he, he's got 67 verses, and I'll never be able to cover all of that. But I want you to read with me from uh, chapter number 24 and verse number 56. The servant of Abraham said, uh, and he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah. And said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah, and said unto her, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands, of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate and uh, the gates of those which hate, hate thee. And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man, and followed the man, and the servant took Rebekah and went his way. This is an important chapter for a lot of reasons, I'm just going to call your attention to that verse number 60 and let you ponder that and maybe do some research. But that verse 60 is explicitly what the Lord had promised to Abraham. And you remember the story of how Abraham and his wife had both gotten up in years and did not have uh, a posterity. They did not have a son that could carry on the family name and how the Lord had miraculously provided for that in giving them this son, Isaac. So this is important because it, it tells us that God is still keeping his word and carrying out his promises as uh, he had given to Abraham. And then he renewed those promises and he made covenants with them. And this, of course, is talking ultimately about the, uh, the state of the, of the Jews, the Israelites, that uh, will come into play later on in this chapter or in this book and then all through the Old Testament. And even today, they're still the apple of God's eye. There's a lot of blunders that Israel's involved in. But don't ever mistake that God's finished with them or he's turned his back on them. I'll always side with Israel in any situation. They're God's chosen people, and uh, I am for them. He's still working out his plans for that people. But I want you to look at this chapter, and I read it, and I prayed over it, and I thought about it. I read what others said, and I thought the best way perhaps for me to handle this this morning is just take a few minutes and introduce you to the characters that are in this story and uh, see if we can get to the altar by the end of the chapter and uh, see how this wedding is going to take place and how that it is going to take uh, how it's going to shape up a bride for Isaac a bride for Isaac now you need to remember and I'll refer to this again in just a moment but you need to remember Genesis 22 Abraham and Isaac went up Mount Moriah and there the Lord had called on Abraham to offer his son Isaac on the altar as a sacrifice. We see that in Genesis chapter number 22. God had made promises to Abraham and Sarah, but in chapter 23, Sarah died. 
and it's the story of Abraham purchasing the cave at uh, Mount Pelah and the property there and burying his wife, Sarah. And then in chapter number 24, we pick up with, uh, with uh, Abraham and, and his longing for a bride for his son. Sarah is gone. Abraham is old. His son is not yet attached. He doesn't have a wife. He, he doesn't have, uh, th- there's nothing showing how that the promise of God can be fulfilled in Isaac. And uh, so, we, so we learn, first of all, about Abraham, the father who desires a bride for his son. God had promised him a great posterity, and yet there was nothing on the scene that looked like that promise was going to be fulfilled. Next, we see the servant of Abraham. Uh, the Bible said that Abraham called his son Uh, called his servant and swore him, made him pledge that he would do what he wanted him to do. And that was to go back to where Abraham's roots was, go back to where his other kinfolks was, to go back there and find a bride for Isaac. Now he said, whatever you do, don't come back with a Canaanite woman. You find a bride out of our family, out of the family tree. Don't, don't let him marry a Canaanite woman. And, and then the servant said, well, what if I get there and can't find one? You want me to come back and get Isaac and let him go look the crop over? He said, whatever you do, don't take Isaac. Don't take Isaac. And so the servant promised that he would do that. And he went to, went to uh, where Abraham had come from. And the Bible said he'd come from Ur of the Chaldees, and uh, he went there, and uh, he went specifically with that mission to find a bride for Isaac. Now, a couple of things that I'll share with you about that servant. He is unnamed. His name is never called in Genesis 24. Now, some believe that this is probably Abraham's servants identified in uh, earlier chapters as Eleazar. That perhaps is who it is. It may be that Eleazar has died for this time, and this is a character that we don't know. But the significance is that his name is ever called. He remained the unnamed servant of Abraham, and he goes on a mission to find a bride for Isaac. Now, here's the significance of that. The unnamed servant is a picture of the Holy Spirit. He is a type of the Holy Spirit. Just as Abraham is a type of God the Father, this servant is a type of the Holy Spirit. And what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit in light of this? In John chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said, When he, the Spirit of truth, has come... The Holy Spirit, when he has come, he will guide you in all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. He will not speak of himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. And then Jesus said, he will glorify me. Now, if you run into preachers or churches or ministries that focus on the Holy Spirit, and that's all they talk about, and Jesus gets very little attention at all, run from it just as fast as you can. You want to know whether a ministry is spirit-backed and spirit-filled? Listen to how long and how much attention they give to the Lord Jesus. The role of the Holy Spirit is not to magnify himself, but to magnify the Lord Jesus and to glorify him. And in this mission, this this mission that the servant was sent on, he had one objective, and that was to make Isaac look great and to select a suitable bride for him. That's what he was all about. He wasn't going for fame or fortune. He was going to magnify Isaac 
and to find a bride for him. He will glorify me. Jump over to the book of Acts, though. Let me share another verse with you. They're having that uh, famous Jerusalem council in Acts 15. And uh, there's some uh, discussion going on. Typical of church groups, you know, to have some uh, friendly banner, you know. Uh, sometimes churches have intensified fellowship. I don't know if you know anything about that or not. But anyway, there was a, there was a conference that was taking place. And the speaker arose and began to talk, and he was defending Simon, and here's what he said. He said in verse number 14, Simon hath declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. God at first visited the Gentiles. Now, when Jesus was about to be crucified, you remember that, that, that famous uh, passage where Pilate come back to them and they said, what do you want me to do with, uh, with Barabbas? They said, release him. And he said, what do you want me to do with Jesus? They said, crucify him and let his blood be on us and our people. And that was the turning point. Jesus died, of course, and then that 40 days afterwards or 50 days altogether, he, he went back to heaven, he ascended back to heaven, and the church, uh, the, the apostles went about the ministry that they'd been given. And for the early chapters of the book of Acts, they are focused on Jewish evangelism. They're in Jerusalem, they're in the land of Israel, and they focused on that. But there came a turning point. There came a turning place when the Lord shifted the emphasis away from the Gentiles, away from the Jews, and put the focus on the Gentiles. And that was the beginning of the great mission. The Jews had rejected him, and for the time being, the Lord set them aside to focus on the, the Gentiles. And the Holy Spirit began to work. And uh, there's, uh, there's some other discussion in there. You, you remember uh, how that uh, Peter had that revelation, the sheet that come down and, and, and was filled with all kind of animals. And uh, Peter said, yeah, but this one's unclean and that one's unclean and that one's unclean. And the, the Lord said to him, Peter, don't call that which I have created common or unclean. And what he was saying to Peter is, the Lord loves the Jews, yes, but he loves the Gentiles too. He loves all of us. And the mission was that every person would hear the gospel story. The mission was that every person could be saved. The mission was that the church would be made up of Jews that were saved to be sure, but there would be some other people outside the fold of Judaism that would be saved. And we are living in the age of the Holy Spirit, His work in the world today, and His mission is to call out a people for His name, to select, to call a bride for God's Son, His Isaac, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, folks, that's the mission of the church. That's our mission because that's his mission. If we're not involved in that mission, we are missing the mission of the Lord. These days are days of evangelism and discipleship and harvest. These are days to call men and women to come to Jesus and to be saved. This afternoon... Uh, I don't know exactly what time you may be aware of it. One of the godless men our times have known anything about, Dr. Henry Blackaby. Dr. Blackaby passed away now. It's been probably 10 days ago. But uh, they're having his funeral service this afternoon at First Baptist Church in Jonesboro. Great man. And probably you have done the experience in God. I think all Baptists did that. And have done it, and some are doing it again. They've just recently released a new version and uh, a new program or package. And, and, uh, but anyway, 
Dr. Blackaby taught us in that experience in God, he taught us that what we're to do is to find out where God is working and join him in the mission. Join him in the mission. We're not to have our mission. We're to have his mission and his mission for this age, his program for this time is to call out a people for his name. And so the servant, the servant was extremely loyal. He was extremely faithful to his master, and he went on his mission to find a bride for Isaac. And so Abraham is typical of God the Father. The servant is typical of the Holy Spirit. And then there is Isaac, the bridegroom. He's not called that, and, and Rebecca's not called the bride, but that's exactly what we have in this chapter, exactly what we have. Now, the last time that we saw Isaac, he has not been seen since Mount Moriah. If you go back and read Genesis 22, you read of how they ascended the mountain and how they carried everything with them. You remember Isaac questioned his father. He said, here's the wood and here's the knife, but where is the sacrifice? And I've no doubt with a broken voice and tears on his face, Abraham said, my son, God will provide a sacrifice. Well, what he actually said is God will provide himself a sacrifice. And while they were going up one side of the mountain, there's an old ram that was going up the other side of the mountain, got his horns caught in the thicket. And you know the story of Abraham was just about to plunge the knife into the heart of his son, and the Lord stayed his hand. You see, the Lord never was interested in really taking Isaac. All he wanted to know was whether Abraham's heart was where it ought to be. He found out that Abraham was willing to give his own son to prove his love and loyalty to God himself. And when he saw that Abraham was willing to do that, he stayed his hand and he provided a substitute for his son in that ram. And the ram was slain and uh, he, he was uh, the sacrifice and from that point on, Isaac is not seen. Go back and read the story. It says that Abraham and his servants came down from the mountain, the Mount Moriah. They came down, but Isaac is not mentioned in that. And I think what's implied in that, I think what is implied in that story is when we get to the New Testament, we see where God provided the ram. We see where God provided the sacrifice, and that sacrifice is his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But he didn't stay his hand. When he got to Calvary, when he got to the cross, he didn't stop the execution. Jesus was crucified. Abraham typical of God, God the Father permitted, he allowed his son to be executed, crucified on the cross. And Romans chapter 8, I believe verse number 39 said, if God did not spare his own son, how much more will he not through him provide for us all things? God did not spare his own son. And so Isaac died typically. And, uh, and then uh, the suggestion is resurrection. When that the lamb was offered, we know that Isaac was still alive at that particular point, even though it's not specifically stated that he came back with, the, uh, uh, with Abraham and his servants. We just, we just know that the father did not spare his own son, but delivered him up. And with him, he will freely give us all things. Verse number 36 of Genesis 24, the servant said to Rebekah's family, Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him, he has given all that he has. 
The father gave everything that he had. He vested everything in his son. And when he gives us his son, he gives us everything that he has. Oh, if we could just realize our position in Christ. Everything we need is in him. I read a story a number of years ago about a very wealthy man. A wealthy man that uh, had one son, only heir that he had. The time come for the man to, to leave this world, and so he passed away. And he had left instructions that when he died, there was to be a large auction. And they were going to auction off everything that he had, all the uh, all the. Uh, Everything in the house, the house, the barns, the buildings, everything, the land. And everybody knew, man, that's going to be a rich auction. Everybody was wanting to get their part of it. They wanted to be there, and they wanted to bid on what they were interested in. But the man had one instruction beyond that. He said, I want this picture. He had a portrait of his son. And he said, I want this portrait to be the first thing that is sold. The first thing you put on the auction block, this. Well, everybody was kind of grieved about that. They thought it was just a really silly thing to, uh, to please the Father. And uh, they uh, waded through that because that was his wishes. And so that portrait went on the auction block. Nobody was really interested. It wasn't even a really good portrait but it was put up for bids, and finally somebody made a token bid on it just to get it over with and get on about their business and bought it at a ridiculously cheap price. When they bought that portrait, the auctioneer announced, auction done, auction over, that's it. What do you mean that's it? What about all this other stuff? And what the father had instructed was this, whoever gets my son, the portrait of my son, whoever gets that, gets it all. He gets it all. Oh, listen, when we got Jesus, we got it all. The Bible said you are complete in him. He is the prize. He is the prize. No wonder that the servant spent his time representing Isaac to, uh, to Rebekah and to her family. And they fell in love with him just by the testimony and the witness of the Holy Spirit. And you know, Tracy, that's all we can do is preach. But then the Holy Spirit has to work and witness and woo the hearts of men and women and draw them to the Savior. And that's what he does. He woos to win, and he doesn't do that by magnifying himself, but he does that by magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaac, the bridegroom, he's worthy of our attention a lot more than I'll give him this morning, but in him we see the son that is obedient unto death. Obedient unto death. Philippians chapter number 2 said, that he was found in appearance as a man, and yet he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus was the obedient son, willing to go to the cross because we needed him. We needed him. And he did, and he died. Back on Moriah, I mentioned a few minutes ago, the ram became the substitute. And when Jesus died on the cross, he became our substitute. He died in our place. I was just as sure to be on the cross. I deserved to be on the cross, and you did too. But I'm so thankful that Jesus died in my place. That's why we can be saved is because he died in our place. And then I mentioned the fact that uh, the ram was substituted and then that Isaac is 
not mentioned anymore. Let me read what Hebrews said about that. Hebrews 11, verse 17 to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he would receive the promises, offered up his only begotten son. What he was saying is, God, you promised me a posterity as broad as the stars of the heaven and the uh, sand on the seashore. I don't see how that's going to happen if I kill my son. I don't know how that's going to take place. But he said, I'm willing to trust you. And he was obedient and did what the Lord asked. And, uh, and the Lord had said to him, and Isaac, your seed will be blessed. And he concluded that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figuratively sense. Abraham received Isaac back as raised from the dead in a figurative sense. But Easter was no fluke. The cross was real. The tomb was dark and damp and cold. But I want to tell you, three days later, the resurrection was able to obliterate all of that. Jesus got up, shook off the grave clothes, and stepped out on resurrection ground. And he said, I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. Our resurrected living Lord. Isaac was not seen from that scene until we get to chapter number 24. And then we see Rebekah, the bride, the bride. The servant came, and, and he didn't know where to look for a bride. He didn't know what a bride was supposed to look like. And so he prayed. He got to the well there in the, the area where he was, and he prayed. And he said, Lord, uh, help me to find a bride. And here's what I think she ought to look like. He said, when I ask for her to give me a sip of water, and she says, okay. But then if she goes on to say, let me draw water for your camels as well, he said, I'll know that's her. And he asked for a drink of water, and she gave him a whole yeti full. Amen. All he could drink. But then she said, while you're drinking, let me draw water for your camels. Now, the Bible does say there were ten camels in that entourage, loaded down with goods from Isaac to win and woo Rebekah. And ten camels, I understand each of those camels could have drank about a barrel full of water. And while Isaac was, or while the servant was drinking and satisfying his thirst, she was busy drawing water, 10 barrels to, for his camels that they'd have enough. And the servant said, man, a girl like this would make a good, would make a good bride. Amen. And of course, there's a lot of cultural colloquial history in that i don't know if there's a camel in in uh, this county or not i don't know but there would have been lots of them then and there'd also been a lot of people drawing water it would have fit the times but she was extraordinary in what she was willing to do well i've got to make a long story short the servant followed her to her, to her family to the house and he said my master sent me on this mission and I've put, uh, I've put the question to the test, and the Lord has led me and directed me, and I believe Rebecca's the one. And I want to know if you'll give me your blessing, if you'll allow it. And uh, <clears throat> they talked about it. You can read some of the details and, uh, and think about what all that, that transpired in that particular place. But the bottom line is, in a very short time, Rebecca fell in love with Isaac. Her family realized the opportunity. They fell in love with him as well. You know what the New Testament said? Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 8, Whom having not seen, 
you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Trace, I've never seen Jesus. Have you? Just in his word. Just in his word. Never laid eyes on him. And I want to tell you, a number of years ago, I fell in love with him. He became my dearest friend. And all these years, I've traveled loving Jesus, following on with the promise that someday I'll see him face to face. Whom having not seen, what motivated Rebecca to make the right decision? She had heard the word. The Bible said faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17, and hearing by the word of God. That's where faith comes from. She heard the word as it was ministered by the servant typical of the Holy Spirit. And everything she heard convinced her that this was the right thing. It was right for her to leave her family and to follow this man that she had not met until then. To follow him across the desert, difficult journey, to get to that place where she would finally see her Isaac face to face. And then those verses that I read about how they had the discussion, will she go, we leave now. They said, let Rebecca decide this. Let's let her decide this. And they called Rebecca and they said, will thou go with this man? And that's the question the Holy Spirit puts to every individual. Will you go? Will you go? Will you accept the word you have heard about the Lord Jesus? Will you accept it enough to put your faith and trust in Him and to leave all that you've ever known behind, to go through a, an experience you know nothing about and to go to a place you know nothing about and go to a man that you have never seen and then to be His bride? Will you go with this man? And I love the answer. Rebecca said, I will go with this man. I will go. The Christian life has always been pictured as a pilgrimage, moving through this world, going to a place, going somewhere. And that place is heaven. Eventually we'll get home. And he whom we have not seen, though we have loved him, will become sight and we'll meet, we'll meet our heavenly bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said that Rebecca and her nurse and her maids, they rode the camels. Somebody said nothing more crooked or uneasy than the back of a camel. Than the back of a camel. But she went. It would be a rough journey. There would be wind. There, there would be... Uh, dust storms, that would be a uh, desert. It would be a rough journey for her. And yet she would go. And let me tell you quickly, and we'll have the invitation in just a minute, but every once in a while she might get a little discouraged along the way. Have you ever been discouraged? You know what discouragement is? She'd get a little discouraged. And if you read the story, you pick up on this. That servant would reach into his backpack. And he'd pull out a, I don't know, two-carat diamond, a bar of gold, a little silver. And all the way when she got to those low points, he was handing her those treasures, those special gifts. And he'd say, here, this is from Isaac. This is from Isaac. Remember, he's got all that his father had. It's all in his hands. And along the way, just little tokens. And that's what the Lord does for us. Along the way, when we need it, unexpectedly, he'll share with us little nuggets of truth, little little 
uh, gold trinkets that will invigorate us and renew us and cause us to stay on the journey and to keep on the way. That's what the Lord does. I don't know if you've had that experience, but over these years, many, many times, the Lord's done just that thing for me. Well, uh, <clears throat> they made the journey, and one day late in the evening, she lit lifted up her eyes, and she saw a man out there walking in the field. She asked the servant, said, who is this? That's in the very end of this chapter. said, who is this? And he said, oh, that's Isaac. And while she was on that journey, Isaac would come out in the evening, and he would look on the horizon waiting for the caravan. And though on that day, she saw him. She saw him. And the Bible said she lit off the camel, got off the camel, put a veil around her face, as would have been typical of a bride in that day, and she ran to meet him for the very first time. And the Bible said that Isaac received her and took her into his mother's tent, and a wedding took place, and she became the bride of Isaac. It just makes goose pumps run, uh, pump, uh, bumps run all over me to think about that glorious reunion. I've never I've had a lot of weddings, but I've never saw an ugly bride. Have you? Have you? I never saw an ugly bride. All brides are beautiful. My bride was the prettiest I ever saw before since. I want to tell you something. The Bible said, by the way, you can trace this out as well. The Bible said that the church is the bride of Christ, and we're in the process now of making ourselves ready, and one day we're going to a marriage supper in heaven. And we're going to be united with our Isaac for all eternity. Well, I hope the message has spoken to you and encouraged you and helped you, but there's one thing that we've got to ask as we get ready for the invitation and Tracy comes and helps us with that, and that is the Holy Spirit is speaking to hearts and lives today. Will you go with this man? Will you receive the Lord Jesus? Will you commit your life to him? And will you begin the journey that will take you away from everything you know down here to everything he's prepared for us on the other side? My prayer today is you'll be like Rebecca and say, I will go with this man. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for allowing me to just scratch the surface of all there is in this marvelous story of how that the servant was able to find a bride and take her back to Isaac that was waiting. One day we'll see our heavenly Isaac. We'll see the Lord Jesus. We love him now. But we'll love him 10,000 times more than when we see him face to face. And I pray for that dear person that has listened to this message and that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to their heart, saying, will you go with this man? Will you trust this man? Will you receive the Lord Jesus into your life? And I pray that they will not delay, but they will say, I will go with this man. Bless the invitation in Jesus' name. While we're saying, is there anyone today that will say, I'll go with him?
sure you know everything in the Bible is laying out God's plan for his creation. Every book, every story, every incident. And it's powerfully declared, even in the book of Genesis, what God is about, his mission for this whole world. And that points us all to Jesus. Everything is about Jesus and your relationship with him. What he could do for you if you would respond to him. And this story is a great example. I just love the idea of Rebecca saying, I will leave everything behind and go to this new life in what the Lord is clearly calling. When you come to Christ, you have to turn your back on everything the world is trying to give to you. All that's being offered, all the false hopes that this world tries to demonstrate and entice. And you have to turn to Jesus. He's the one. He died for your sins. He is worthy of your love and everything that you have. And he'll be with you for your whole life. We need to hear this again and again, don't we, church? Somebody here today needs to give their heart to Jesus. Somebody else here today who's made that decision just needs to remember, I'm all for Christ and nothing else. I'm devoted to him. I'm sold out for him and his kingdom and for his purpose. This is your time of response. You can stand right where you are, but you need to say to the Lord, my life belongs to you. I know that you are all that I need, and I just reaffirm again, I'm committed to you. If you need to come, come to the altar. If you need to come speak with me, speak with Brother Clifton, come during this time. You respond as the Lord leads you. Thank you for being here today. I hope you'll make plans to come back. Join us this evening, full schedule tonight, uh, youth and kids at 5, and uh, our worship service will be at 6. Choir practice, 5 o'clock, choir practice too. Saw a great group in the choir this morning. There's always a seat for you, so you come be part of that as well. Thank you, Brother Clifton. I wrote down intensified fellowship. I, I like that phrase. <laughs> We Baptists know what that's about. I like it. And I'm always reminded of just this um, all-consuming mission of God. Everything on every page is the Lord at work in this world. And that tells me he wants to be at work in your life. If you let him work, he'll do amazing things. Let's pray together as we close. David Callahan, would you close us in prayer, please, sir?